St. George and the Not-So-Naughty Dragon Chapter 2 Dragon Names By Yu Mei Master, thought Sir George. His hair standing on end, Sir George reminded himself that the monster could turn on him or flee at any moment. But after he clicked the bridle rein into place, he was relieved to see the dragon meekly walk by his side, like a dog on a leash. After fetching his spear, he caught sight of the sword Ascalon, half buried under rubble. As he reached for it, the dragon scooped it up in her mouth and offered it to him. The blade was badly in need of a polish and would have to be sharpened, but to his relief it hadn't been smashed or twisted by the falling rocks. As they left the caves behind and stepped out of the pond, the dragon surprised him by shaking herself like a dog. Sir George winced as a droplet of water flew into his eye. Don't do that, beast. The dragon scraped her claws against the ground and shivered, as though awaiting a blow. I'm sorry, my master. Seeing her fear, Sir George softened his tone. Master, you call me? Well, what should I call you, dragon? The dragon cautiously opened one eye, still expecting a thrashing. What is wrong with calling me dragon? It is a good word. With a light tug on the leash, Sir George led her into the grove. Well, it'd be like calling every man I meet, man, and him calling me, man. Without names, it'd be confusing. The dragon nodded, then curled her frilled ears behind her. But, you don't know any other dragons, do you? Sir George scratched his head. As he did, his grip on the leash tightened, and to his surprise, the dragon immediately came alongside him, brushing against his leg. Already she was responding to the leash better than the finest hound he'd ever trained. Well, no, but I should still know your name so I can speak to you properly. But you spoke to me very properly in the cave, without knowing my name. Without even knowing that I was a dragon. Sir George examined their surroundings. He realized that, by sending Bayard home, he had sent most of his camping equipment along with him. He had not planned on spending the night in the woods with a dragon. Well, amongst knights, it's considered a matter of honor to share our name when asked, except in the most urgent of circumstances. Do dragons not share their names? Or do you not have a name? Her cat-like eyes brightened as she looked up, like an expectant puppy. Oh, I understand honor. I would love to share my name with you. But it is difficult, for we dragons have many names. The people of your country have named me Angel Twish. Angel Twish? After the red worm? Angel Twick raised her tail like a dog ready to play, then started to strut. Is that what it means? I like it even more now. Though, the Maggie girl called me Angel when she came to the caves, calling for me to come out. Sir George suddenly remembered from his conversation with the village girl. That's right, she said you attacked an outlaw who was after her. I assumed you were hunting for both and caught him by happenstance. Angeltwick shook her head. No. I knew the smell of the Maggie girl from the village, but the outlaw man had a foul smell. After I dropped him, that was the first time she named me Angel. Well, then is Angel your name? It is one of them now. Is that what your mother and father call you? The dragon's ears flicked up in alarm, then cocked at a curious angle as she considered the question then finally flopped down in meek surrender. Not sure what else to do, Sir George tried petting the dragon's neck, feeling stupid. Immediately, she responded to the touch, angling her head to guide his hand to the spot between her two horns. As he patted her head at the right spot, she purred, and finally found her tongue. That is not an easy question to answer. Dragons have hundreds of names. For each season of life, a different name. It will take many nights to tell you all my names. Sir George squinted. Very well. Then is there just one name you like best of all to be called? The dragon's ears perked up again at this question, but then she caught sight of a butterfly. Just before Sir George was about to repeat the question, she snapped her head back to face him. My barber used to call me, Tianxi. I always used to like the sound of that name, especially the way he said it. Sir George's ears perked at the strange sound of the name. Ten, she. The dragon shook her head. No, Tian Shi. Sir George felt his tongue trip over the odd sounds. Tian Shin? The dragon sighed with disappointment. It doesn't sound the same. Well, what does it mean? And Jeltwick closed her eyes, smiling wanly. It has many meanings. Before Sir George could argue the point, 
he saw Angel Twicky become alert, pointing her snout as she spotted a horse ahead of them. Bayard had returned. Sir George rolled his head back and laughed. Bayard, you prince among horses. I should have known you'd never abandon. Suddenly remembering the carnivorous dragon at his side, he glanced down just in time to catch her licking her lips and grabbed her by the horn. No, you are not to eat that horse, nor harm him, nor frighten him. He is a loyal friend. Angeltwick hunched her shoulders and her tail hung between her legs. No, master, I mean, yes, master. Yes, I will obey you, so, no, I will not eat him. Curiously, Bayard approached, braying joyfully at the sight of his rider, but snorting furiously at the hint of sulfur in the air that warned him of the dragon. George tugged gently at the dragon's leash, and Angeltwick lowered her head submissively. Satisfied, Bayard cantered to George's side. Glancing at the dragon's humiliating position, Sir George felt conflicted. Yes, the dragon was accused of various crimes, and was almost certainly guilty of poaching livestock, but his memory of the promise he made in the cave haunted him. When he'd imagined Angeltwick as a human woman in need of rescue, he hadn't imagined hauling that woman home on a leash. Dragon, why must you call me master? You're a prisoner, but you're not my slave. I must call you master, because under the law of dragons, you are my master. I surrender to you of my own free will. Well, suppose I ask you to call me Sir George, and not Master. If you order me to never call you, Master, then I will never call you Master again. But I do so because you are my Master. Bayard blew his lips in an almost human laugh. The dragon opened its jaws wide and made a low, rumbling chirp noise, lolling its forked tongue. Sir George tensed before a strange thought occurred to him. Was Angeltwick laughing? Bruh. I like this Bayard. Prince of Horses. He has a sense of humor, Master. Oops. I mean, Sir George. It is hard to remember that my master is never to be called Master. I'm afraid you shall have to beat me soundly until I remember. As Angeltwick lowered herself to present her back to receive his blows, Sir George rolled his eyes and settled down on a bedroll. Fine. Have it your way, dragon. But no beatings. I would like you to call me Sir George. I am not ordering you. I am asking you, if you would like to, because it will make me happier. The dragon pulled its lips back. Sir George recoiled, wondering if it was about to snap at him, before he recognized it as a smile. Very well, Sir George. I will remember to call you that. If I sometimes forget, and call you master by mistake, will you whip me? Sir George glanced down at the bridle, remembering that the dragon had initially thought of it as a lash. No, I shall try to not be cross with you, if you forget, dragon. The dragon's smile widened. Each of her teeth could rip the flesh from the bones of an ox. So, I am free to call you whatever I wish? Sir George wondered if this was a trick question. He had heard tales of dragon's love for riddling talk. You are always free to call me whatever you wish, dragon, if you're not afraid of a whipping. But I will not whip you for calling me, master, if that is your wish. With another rumble of draconic laughter, Angeltwick rested her head on his lap. A delightful answer, Sir George. It is not a shameful thing, amongst dragons, to have a master. So, thank you, Sir George, for granting me the liberty to call you my master. We dragons prize our freedom. Then why did you agree to surrender to me, dragon? She lifted her head from his lap and gazed down on him with the fixed gaze of a predator. As long as he was seated, she towered over him. Sir George subconsciously gripped the sheath of Ascalon, ready to draw it in a flash. Because, Sir George, you spoke to me with the same voice as the man who spoke to me in the cave. Remembering the voice of the frightened maiden in the cave, Sir George loosened his grip on his hilt. Say, what if I called you, Angel? The same name Maggie called you? You seem to like that one. The dragon cocked her head. I love that name. She said it so prettily. What does Angel mean? An angel is a winged messenger. A celestial being who serves God. The dragon narrowed her eyes. Which God? Sir George made the sign of the cross and gestured to the world around them, thinking the answer perfectly obvious. The one, true God, of course. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So, there are three gods, then? Which of them is your one, true, 
God? No. Not three gods. One God, in three persons, in perfect unity. The dragon cocked her head to the other side. My Borba told me the god your people worship was named Yesu Jaidu. Are you not one of the Nazarenes? Sir George struggled with the unfamiliar sounds. But their meaning clicked into place as he recognized the word, Nazareth. Yes. Jesus Christus. He is called Jesus of Nazareth, or Christ, in our tongue. So, this man from Nazarene is your one true God? Is he the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit you speak of? No. Jesus Christus is the Son of God, incarnate. God the Father is his Father. The dragon raised an eyebrow. Then what is God the Holy Spirit? Is it his ghost? Sir George swallowed, struggling to find an answer. It would be centuries before St. Brendan the Navigator would receive a mermaid into communion with the Christian Church, but Sir George was motivated by the same missionary fervor. The conversion of a dragon to the true faith would be a momentous omen. Unfortunately, though he had faithfully attended Mass since his first catechism, the blessed mysteries of the Trinity were not Sir George's strong suit. He was the direct sort of fighting man of a simpler age. No, Jesus is not a ghost, God the Holy Spirit is, the Helper. The friend sent by the Father to aid us all. Sir George searched the dragon's face, but whether or not she found his explanation compelling, she hid it well. It is a mysterious creed. We have heard little of the Nazarene himself in my home, though much of the followers of his Tao. Wasn't he a fisherman? Sir George nodded, hoping to expound more doctrine, before remembering Jesus was not a fisherman. No, he was a carpenter. Some of his disciples were fishermen. In the Gospel of... But before he could recount the parable of the fishes, Angel Twick interrupted him. Excuse me, but what is a carpenter? Sir George looked to his horse, who seemed equally befuddled, before answering. You don't know what a carpenter is? It's a man who builds things from wood. Tables, chairs, buildings. Build, ings? Those flimsy things made from dead trees that you keep your food in? I keep knocking them down by accident. Did a carpenter build those? Well, I suppose one must have, but... Ah, yeah. That must be why your God, the carpenter, has been so cross with me. No wonder I've had such rotten luck in your country. I'm always knocking into things. It's this cursed tail. I always forget it's back there. The dragon lifted her own tail and slapped it soundly three times, adding a sharp flick of her wrist to each swat. She then set her tail down firmly, staring at it as though her own tail was a naughty child in need of censure. Then she turned her attention back to Sir George and Bayard as if nothing had happened. Dubuchi, I'm so sorry. What were we talking about? Sir George struggled to remember how precisely he had ended up discussing theology and the woods with a mad dragon. Um. A puff of smoke erupted from Angeltwick's nostrils. That's it. You wish to name me Angel. And an angel is a slave of your god. Well, I do not know your god, but since you serve this god, and since I am your slave, I suppose it is a fitting name for me. Sir George groaned. You are not my slave, Angeltwish. You are my captive. Angeltwick stroked her chin. What is captive under your law, Sir George? To be honest, Sir George knew of no laws, whether secular or ecclesiastical, that dealt with his precise situation. It means you must face justice for the harm you've caused. Angeltwick's throat rumbled, and her whine was like an expectant dog's. Is this because you do not know if I am a good dragon, or a bad dragon, yet? Sir George huffed and laid his head on his bedroll, not wanting to bother with a blanket in the summer night air. Lying next to Angel, he realized her body seemed to radiate a fiery heat. Yes, Angel. Tomorrow, we will decide if you are a good dragon, or a bad dragon. But as for tonight, I am exhausted. As dusk settled, Angel's eyes flickered with an inner light that stood out against the twilight blue sky. You called me, Angel? Is that my name? Wondering if he would ever get to sleep, Sir George rolled to face away. Hopefully this dragon really was evil, and would eat him quickly in his sleep to end his suffering. Yes. Angel is your name, if it pleases you. He heard her whisper softly in his ear, and felt her forked tongue. If the name Angel pleases my master, then it pleases me. Brushing away the tongue, Sir George turned to face his tormentor. Yes, it pleases me. I think it's a lovely name. 
and it's not a name for a slave. It's a name for a magnificent, glorious creature. An emissary of the Most High. A winged messenger of the King of Kings. An emissary? A winged messenger? That is an angel? I love this name. It honors me. Sir George threw up his hands in surrender. Very good. It only took us one day, but your name is Angel. Now go to sleep, Angel, or I'll spank you. He meant it as an empty threat, not really sure that the word would mean anything to a dragon. And even if it did, the very idea of spanking a fire-breathing dragon seemed like an absurd impossibility. But at the mention of spanking, Angel immediately hunched to the ground, curling up like a cat at Sir George's side, her tail across his feet, her head resting on his chest. Yes, Sir George. As Angel closed her eyes, he suddenly felt the warmth radiating from her belly and nostrils as a comforting presence. Even loyal Bayard had fallen asleep, still standing a silent vigil near his master, his breathing steady. The thought at the back of Sir George's mind, that this dragon was going to eat him at any moment, did not vanish, but a hidden instinct told him he was safe. Angel had given her word. Sir George felt the exhaustion of his long day of adventuring catch up with him all at once, and he began to drift off to sleep. Purring, Angel thought about her new name, and remembered all her old names. Tomorrow, Master will tell me if I am a good dragon, or a bad dragon. If I am a good dragon, I wish to live. If I am a bad dragon, I am ready to die. I wonder if Master will kill me? I ya. Yeah. I cannot wait to find out. Good night, Sir George. For the first time in many, many years, Angel slept peacefully. End of chapter 2. Spanks for listening. If you enjoy my spanking stories, please like and subscribe. And follow me on DeviantArt, Twitter, Patreon, Bitchute, Odyssey, Rumble, Dailymotion, and an archive of our own. You may spank it once.